Well, Kiara Brooks is our speaker this morning. Uh, Kiara is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Barcelona, working on an ERC project, <coughs> Rethinking Conscious Agency. And before that, she was a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Tübingen and at Antwerp. And um, she found out about one month ago, I think it was, that she has been appointed to an associate professorship at the University of Associate professorship, assistant professorship yeah, yeah, just at the University to... of Birmingham back in Britain. So she will be coming to her first permanent job after all these postdoctoral <laughs> positions. Um, so she has a great sigh of relief. But I have, I've got to mention a little bit further back because she also has the, um, she was once a student at Kathy Wilkes College, which is in Builders, and was a student of mine. And she studied philosophy and mathematics. Now, um, she has also written several papers, and she's got a paper forthcoming in philosophical psychology. She's one of the contributing, it's one of these uh, collaborations on the dynamics of responsibility judgment, joint role of dependence and transference, causal explanations and many of her earlier publications are on motor intentions so she's going to speak to us today on beliefs that matter to us core beliefs and transformative experiences here thank you very much and thanks very much to the organizers of this this conference has been absolutely amazing i'm delighted to be here i'm only sorry that Due to a number of uh, uh, logistical snags, I couldn't either be here earlier or and I won't be able to, to stay here longer, but this has been absolutely amazing. So thank you very much for having me here. And uh, I guess sort of my uh, role in this conference is to continue this tradition that was really well exemplified <coughs> by Kathy Wilts of taking really seriously both common sense psychology and scientific psychology and, and to have philosophy sort of taking both into account and wondering how they fit together. Um, and, and partly, as uh, Anissa nicely anticipated, I guess that my connection to Kathy Wilkes is also through having been a student <laughs> at St. Hilda's. This is, I mean, you oh, are obviously the college. <laughs> I can guarantee you that this was the gate, the entrance gate, and this was like Excuse a me? student uh, at St. Hilda's, and in particular, was Anita's student in philosophy of mind, and I owe her a huge debt of gratitude for inspiring me to, um, to I'm not sure what happened there. That's okay, we're back again. Right, so, <coughs> sorry, for inspiring me to become a professional philosopher. I really owe the inspiration to her, and I think that it's absolutely uh, really important that there are people who inspire other students. I know I'm not the only one, there will be another one who is mentioned later in this presentation, who were also inspired by Anita's teaching uh, to be a professional philosopher. So yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, so today's uh, topic, as, as mentioned before, will be core beliefs and transformative experiences. And in order to introduce it, I want to start with an example drawn from this um, novel, uh, by Emily Notomo, which is a fictional autobiography where the author describes herself in the, in the first years of her life as uh, initially something, thinking of herself as this very angry god perpetually at war with the world um, until, uh, thanks to her paternal grandmother who introduces her to white chocolate, she makes peace with the world and she starts thinking of herself as this benevolent creature that is ready to enjoy the beauty that the world has to offer. And um, she describes this change following tasting white chocolate for the first time in following terms. And thus it was that I was born in Japan at the age of two and a half in February of 1970 in the province of Kansai in the village of Shukugawa under the benevolent gaze of my paternal grandmother and by the grace of her white chocolate. So this is a fictional example which exemplifies the phenomenon that I want uh, to discuss today, whereby there can be these, these changes in the way we think of ourselves as ourselves, um, which can happen in, in many ways. 
And uh, so in particular, the intriguing question I'm going to be concerned with more generally is how is it that we become the particular person that we are and that we take ourselves to be? Um, and I think that becoming a particular person uh, or thinking of ourselves as a particular person goes hand in hand with acquiring certain thoughts, which I will call core beliefs. Um, <coughs> Now, since I know that this is, and, and this is amazing actually, a very interdisciplinary setup, I'm, I'm going to try to explain all the technical terms I'm going to use, beginning with belief. Well, very roughly, belief is a thought expressing something you take to be true. So, for example, if you take it to be true that it is sunny today, as it thankfully is, it is beautiful, since you will believe that it is sunny today. That's just what a belief roughly is. Now, a core belief, is a belief that matters a lot for your self-conception, that is, for the way you think of yourself as yourself. So, some of my core beliefs are that I'm a philosopher, I'm an anglophile, believe it or not, I mean, <laughs> British people are usually shocked with the statement, but that's true, I'm an anglophile. Um, cats are wonderful creatures, I am a cat person, this really matters to me. So these are some of my uh, core beliefs. So in general, and these are beliefs that matter a lot for the way we think of ourselves for ourselves. Um, and now, as we shall see later, precisely because these are beliefs that we identify with, they can also behave in very interesting ways, in particular in the light of evidence. I will only get to that towards the end of my presentation. So another intriguing question that relates to the one of how do we become the particular person that we are is how do we acquire or give up our beliefs? Um, and I will suggest that the way in which we uh, can acquire and also give up our beliefs is through so-called transformative experiences, which I will define in a moment. The, the notion is not one that I came up with. Um, I'll tell you about it uh, shortly. So, and recently I realized that one of the main reasons why I'm interested in transformative experiences is as gateways to core beliefs, either acquiring or giving up core beliefs. So to give you a sense of what um, transformative experiences are, consider the following example. Suppose that one day, like Alice in Wonderland, you decide to follow the white rabbit down the rabbit hole. Now, presumably, it won't be possible for you to anticipate what this experience is going to be like, and moreover, <coughs> Um, this experience might change you profoundly, might change the way you think of yourself as yourself. You might uh, acquire um, like a taste for adventure that you didn't have before, or else you might become much more risk averse. But either way, you might change profoundly in ways that are hard to anticipate. So in virtue of these two characteristics, and the fact that you can't know what it's like until it happens, and the fact that you likely alter in some conception in predictable ways, following the white rabbit down the rabbit hole, uh, qualifies as what Laurie Paul would call a transformative experience. So according to her, transformative experiences are experiences that are transformative in two ways. Epistemically, before, because they teach you something you couldn't otherwise have known. Um, they are new experiences. And secondly, they're personally transformative because they change your self-conception in unpredictable ways. And by their definition, transformative experiences can alter your core beliefs. They can provide you with new ones and make you give up old ones. We will actually see more examples of this uh, in the course. And actually, so the, the fictional example that I showed to you earlier of uh, tasting white chocolate for the first time can be seen as a transformative experience in the sense because it was something that the author had never experienced before, and it's altered her, her <coughs> self-conception in such a way that she describes herself of, as being newly born. Um, but there are sort of more real-life examples of transformative experiences that Laurie Bolton is the main person who described and cited them, considers in her book. The paradigm example is having one's first child, but she also considers getting married, fighting the war, or becoming a doctor. There are many uh, more that she talks about in the book, ranging from experiencing the more physical attack to um, winning an Olympic gold medal. But even though these are many examples, you can change still that they are very um, rare and exceptional experiences. 
Um, and in, in general, the standard framework that looks at transformative experiences seems to have bought this assumption that transformative experiences are a real phenomenon, but they are not likely to come up in, very often in the course of our lives. So my thesis today um, is actually going to be that there are many transformative experiences, many more than the standard framework uh, would predict. Chiefly because, as I'm going to show later, they don't need to be of something new. And uh, as there are many more transformative experiences, there are many more gateways to core beliefs that you might uh, imagine. So what I'm going to do is to tell you first a bit more about the notion of transformative experiences uh, according to the current framework, looking at them. And then I will highlight a hidden mistaken assumption within this framework, according to which experiences need to be of something new in order to be transformative. Then I will show what happens if we remove the assumption, as we should, um, which is that it turns out that there are many transformative experiences and therefore many gateways to core beliefs, either acquiring or giving up beliefs. So to start with the current framework, um, I need to introduce the notion of subjective value of an experience, which is a measure of the extent to which we value undergoing a certain experience. Suppose that I really like ice cream, eating ice cream, then eating ice cream has a very high subjective value for me. If I hated it, it would have a very low subjective value. Um, and according to Laurie Hall, with rare exceptions, such as obviously unpleasant experiences, such as swimming with sharks, the example of this hers, we can only assign a subjective value to an experience once we have had it. Um, and what is what work, theoretical work, does the notion of subjective value do? Well, it's crucial for making choices that make sense from our own point of view. And here I, I, I gradually sort of approach a topic that uh, uh, Dennis has worked on, and we'll, we'll see how. So, so consider the following example. Suppose I'm faced with a choice, which color should I paint my bathroom walls, red or green? Suppose that this is the choice, these are the two options. How do I go about making this choice? Well, a sensible suggestion, which has a very long tradition, has it that it would make sense for me to pick the option that I value the most, maybe that has the highest subjective value. Expected utility theory, in particular, frames this in terms of picking the option that maximizes my expected utility. And um, yeah, with this, I, I approach the the work of Dennis because he talked about how uh, this framework won't quite capture our creativity and the fact that we can come up with additional options uh, by, by being creative and describe how this, this happens. So the framework that I'm looking at is takes the, the, the view, sort of takes it for granted that we have already come up with certain options and it describes how we should go about choosing uh, among them, what is the most um, rational way of choosing on them. And this is it. We should pick the option that maximizes our expected utility, which um, in the transformative experiences framework is uh, described as uh, highest subjective value. So, but the point of the subjective value notion is to allow for differences across individuals. It allows for the idea that you and I might assign different subjective values to the same experience. So that different choices will make sense from our own points of view. If I if I love red and 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 you detest it, then it will make a lot of sense for me to have my bubble moles picked red and, and for you it won't. And this will be reflected in a different assignment of subjective values to our options. I will assign a very high subjective value to having my uh, moles painted red, and you will assign a very low subjective value to it. Okay, and, and so the idea that uh, Laurie Paul starts from is that for choices like that, where we can assign a subjective value to our options, we have a very good way of going about making those choices. We just pick the option that has the highest subjective value. But not all the choices that we're faced with are like that. So she now considers the following example of a very different choice, which is, should I have a child or remain childless? And she says, if we uh, apply this standard framework for making choices rationally, 
what I should do is to pick the option that has the highest objective value for me. However, having my first trial is such that it is notoriously difficult to anticipate what it would be like until an analysis happens. That is, it's, it's a notoriously epistemic in terms of experience. So it's going to be it's difficult to anticipate how much I will value this experience and therefore assign a subjective value to it. So prior to undergoing it, this experience has an inaccessible subjective value, which already prevents us from applying the standard framework because one of the subjective values that I should uh, choose between is simply unavailable to me. And the problem is worse than that because um, Having one's first child is also notoriously personally transformative. That is, it typically alters one's values and priorities. And so um, choosing to have this experience might also turn into a very different person, one that has, in the terminology I suggested earlier, very different core beliefs. So even if I could basically make some prediction about how, um, um, how much I'm going to value this option, this prediction might turn out to be dramatically wrong. So how do I make this difference? So on the basis of the account suggested earlier, whereby I should pick the option that has the highest objective value, it's simply not clear how I could make this choice because the subjective value is unavailable for one of the choices and, uh, and moreover, whatever value I assign that might change. I can't pick the option that has the highest subjective value because I do not know the subjective value of having my first child yet. And whatever prediction I might sensibly make now about how much I'm going to value this might turn out to be radically off the mark after choosing this option, because this very choice might turn me into a very different kind of person. So, yeah, I could be much simpler if you want this. Um, so, according to the Sunday framework, the challenge of transformative experiences raised for taking big decisions is what makes transformative experiences philosophically interesting. So this is just to show you like, how and why transformative experiences have featured in the philosophical literature, uh, mainly as a, as a challenge to standard ways of thinking about rational choice. They present a challenge um, because they make it impossible for us to anticipate how much we're going to value them. And also, um, they might make us different people, thus sort of undermining whatever predictions we might make in advance of making them. So the, the focus has been on, on this challenge to standard ways of accounting for rational choice. And so the one thing, one observation that I want to make is we can ask ourselves whether choices should be the focus. And uh, I don't think so, personally, because I think that the main reason why transformative experiences are interesting, are also philosophically interesting, is because they are getting ways to new core beliefs, and sometimes simultaneously even, they need us to abandon old ones, whether we choose to have these experiences or not. So, like I said, the standard framework focuses on <coughs> cases in which we're presented with a choice, and one of our options is a transformative experience, giving rise to all the problems that I highlighted earlier, we can't predict we can't assign a subjective value to them and, and so on. But there are a lot of these transformative experiences that simply happen to us without any choice being involved. And that's interesting too, because even in that case, they lead us to becoming a different kind of person or changing our self-conception. And I think that this is the really interesting thing. But either way, Either if you think of transformative experiences as interesting because they challenge our possibility to choose rationally, um, or more generally as gateways to core beliefs, whether we choose them or not, you might think that uh, transformative experiences are still too few in the course of a lifetime to be interesting. But again, I don't, I don't think so. Um, I think that it will turn out that they're actually very pervasive in the course of one's life if we remove a mistaken assumption from the standard framework, which is what I now turn to. So why are transformative experiences thought to be so few according to the standard framework? Um, one reason, though maybe not the only reason, is that the standard framework locates transformative experiences strictly among experiences of something new. Where by this I mean, well, typically experiences that have a new object, one that we've never experienced before. Um, and you might think that because, for example, Laurie Bullis says as much. 
She says choices involving familiar outcomes, like houses you've seen or places you visited, do not present a problem when we need to assess the expected value of an act. But transformative choices involving radically new experiences do, because they involve epistemically inaccessible subjective values. So Paul explicitly uh, ties the inaccessibility of subjective values to experiences of something new, whereas experiences of things you know already, like houses we've seen and places we've visited, according to her, do not present a problem because we, we have already assigned subjective value to experiences of those things, and therefore the problem doesn't arise. This is the assumption that I'm going to criticize. And indeed, there is a whole trend, which is why I'm appealing to the idea of a standard framework being placed that buys this assumption. So other people that have commented on transformative experiences likewise focus on experiences of something new. So for example, Richard Pedigree says, I've never eaten measurements through their trials. And um, John Campbell and Amy Kind focus on things you can imagine more or less easily given your past experiences as the, the, the crucial point um, when discussing transformative experiences and the challenges that uh, they, um, they bring out. But my thesis is going to be that there are many transformative experiences because they straddle the boundary between experiences of something new and experiences of something known. Um, and I'm going to do this by challenging a certain assumption that concerns, that's part of the subject framework that concerns the relationship between experiences and subjective value. So the idea is, according to the standard framework, once you have had a single experience of a certain thing, say, once you have had a, you have drunk your first coffee in your life, you are then in a position to assign to experiences of this thing, coffee, a subjective value. Let's call it SV1. Now, the, the hidden mistake and assumption in the framework is that undergoing more experiences of the same thing, that is, drinking more coffee in the course of your life, will not alter the initially assigned subjective value uh, SV1. So uh, yeah, I, I can have more and more coffees in the course of my life, whatever subjective value I assign to the experience of drinking coffee the first time will not change. So the standard framework conceives of subjective value as static over uh, multiple experiences of the same thing. Um, whatever uh, subjective value was initially assigned will stay the same upon re-experiencing that thing. Whereas the suggestion that I want to give is that Although this does not have to happen, it can happen that experiencing the same thing upon multiple occasions, so for example, having multiple coffees over time, might lead to modifying the subjective value that we assign <coughs> to experiences of this thing. Um, like I said, it won't always happen, but it can happen. And one reason to think so is the existence of so-called acquired tastes like coffee precisely, which are things that we typically do not like upon our first experience of them. Uh, coffee is one, beer is another. Um, that's why they're called acquired tastes. It takes a while to um, acquire the taste for them. Uh, and there are demonstration of this, uh, the, of the fact that subjective value can change over time over multiple experiences of the same thing. For example, I might start out by not being particularly impressed by coffee the first time I drink it, maybe a second time on a different day I drink coffee, let's suppose it's the same kind of coffee, I will be intrigued and therefore I will assign to experiences of coffee a higher, slightly higher subjective value than I did the first time, until after n coffees I'm now uh, an enthusiastic coffee drinker. And so at that point the, the subjective value that I assign to experiences of drinking coffee has uh, dramatically changed. In particular, it has dramatically increased. Um, so, so far, what I've shown is that even experiences of known things, such as coffee, can lead to dramatic alterations <coughs> in the subjective value that we assign to experiences of those things. I've also shown, although the coffee example is not ideal for this, that it doesn't take experiences of something new for there to be subjective values that are inaccessible prior to the experience. Um, 
what I mean by this is that it might be really difficult if the first time you have coffee, you do not particularly enjoy it, even though you, you know that people typically grow to like it, it might still be very difficult for you to imagine that one day you love it. So there's a sense in which um, this high subjective value that you end up assigning to drinking coffee after the experiences um, is not accessible to you prior to. Suppose that there is an experience that reveals to you that coffee is amazing, it, it might be pretty difficult to access that subjective value prior to that experience. We will see, but hopefully, we'll convince an example later. But for now, I mean, definitely one of its point of now is that um, subjective value can alter across different experiences of the same thing, contrary to what the standard framework assumes. And there's another potential problem, however, with the example that I considered, which is a subjective value of the experience I've considered so far, such as drinking coffee, is typically uh, not considered of personally transformative import. That is, uh, acquiring a taste of coffee normally won't make you into a different person or won't change the way you think of yourself as yourself. The objection might go. I think actually we could have a discussion about that because I think that for some people, believing that coffee is amazing might actually be a core belief. You know, think of someone who devotes their life to uh, I don't know, setting up a, um, uh, a coffee shop or a bar or however you, you call it because of how much they think that, that coffee is amazing and can make I don't know, people's lives better. Whatever. So I think things are a bit more complicated than that, but let's run from the assumption for now that typically growing to like coffee will not make you into a different kind of person. So I want to turn to how experiences of something known can not only have inaccessible subjective values, but also be person like clearly personal transformative. Uh, so I will now turn to this and to now showing that there are many transformative experiences and in particular many more than you may have thought on the basis of the summary account. So I, I said I would switch to a different example, one of them is more clearly transformative, well, personally transformative, and the example is in question is falling out of love. Why do I think it's personally transformative? I want to, I think this is, this is a case that will be familiar to many people, regardless of the details of the one case that I'm going to look at right now. Uh, but, but still, I think that this particular case well illustrates the point that I want to make. The case is one I'm calling Zoe's case because it's about um, this person, Zoe, that is described in the following terms. Despite his egocentric and distant treatment of her between the get togethers, Zoe was crazy in love with Brandon. Then suddenly, out of nowhere, she felt nothing but resentment and disrespect. She had lost everything for him in the course of a few minutes. So this is a case of someone finding that she has fallen out of love with this person that for a long time was really important to her. And what I find interesting is that this can be analyzed as a case in which the subjective value attached to experiences of, in, in this case, a particular person, maybe random, changes over time. So let, let's suppose that the experience is the, the experience of thinking about Brandon and that for a long time, for Zoe, this experience has a really high subjective value because of how much she is in love with him. So for a long time, she thinks of Brandon and this experience has a really high subjective value for her until eventually she wakes up to find that she feels nothing but resentment and disrespect for this guy. Um, so, so we have again a case in which uh, a subjective <coughs> value attached to experiences of, in this case, someone something, has dramatically altered over time. The same thing happened in the coffee case, but now unlike with the coffee case, I think we can agree that this change is also personally transformative. Um, but so not only does the end experience of Brandon, of thinking about Brandon, say, uh, <coughs> Not only does it involve an inaccessible subjective value, because prior to that experience, Zoe might really not have been able to anticipate that she might feel any different towards him. Um, and I want to now show that it is also personally transformative, despite not being an experience of something new. I mean, I think that this might, might already be clear, but just to add further um, like support to this, we can look at Zoe's report. Um, it's always a whole report. Who writes, my whole life would have depended on hearing from him. 
When I didn't hear from him, everything seemed unbearable and gloomy. Couldn't do anything. On the other hand, if I heard from him, I was floating inside a bubble of good fortune, gleefully brimming with energy. I depended so much on him. I depended on him seeing. So this is just a testimony of the importance that uh, being in love with Brandon had for Zoe's self-conception. It seems that it really mattered for the way she thought of herself as a self. And, and I think this is a very vivid demonstration of that. So the relationship seems to be part of Zoe's self-conception. So the change in subjective value attached to experiences of, say, thinking about Brandon is um, also of personally transformative import for Zoe. So this is a genuine, falling out of love is a genuine transformative experience. It's something whose subjective value was inaccessible prior to undergoing the experience. And moreover, it changes Zoe's self-conception in a way that she could not have anticipated. To link this with my general idea that one main reason why transformative experiences are interesting is as gateways to core beliefs. Uh, we can furthermore think that so he might have had a core belief along the lines of Brandon is amazing, or Brandon is the love of my life, which is given up through this transformative experience of falling out of love. And she might also think that she acquire new uh, core beliefs, like he's not a very nice person or, or whatever, that might really be important to, to her self-conception. So to go back to um, why, according to the standard framework, transformative experiences are so few, I sort of gave you reasons for thinking that according to this framework, transformative experiences need to be located strictly among experiences of something new or someone new as the case may be. Whereas um, I have attempted to show that there are many more transformative experiences because transformative experiences can also be found among experiences of, of, of something or someone known. And despite that, they can still be, these experiences can still be transformative. So um, this leads to the conclusion that there are many transformative experiences, definitely many more than you would have thought on the basis of the standard account. And relatedly, there are many chances of um, acquiring new core beliefs and giving up old ones. Uh, this kind of sort of calls based reaction. On one hand, might be a bit unnerving because it might look like we don't have much control over our core beliefs. So actually one of, one of the nice things that uh, um, so this, this workshop has worked <coughs> out is that um, so how, how do we go about you know, what, what are the characteristics of our goal-oriented behavior and one of the notions that were insisted on a lot was this idea of intentions and conscious intentions and the extent to which these can consider our behavior. And so this kind of adds to the picture by, um, by suggesting that even at, at the level of description to which intentions belong, there can be slightly chaotic and serendipitous ways of arriving at uh, these mental states that end up driving our behavior because of how important they are to our self-conception. Um, I also meant to add, and I just um, didn't do it at the, at the right moment, so, so I'll do it now. Actually, I also thought um, that this linked nicely with the talk that Patrick gave yesterday because uh, at some point there was this description of the different choices that a system could make uh, and on the basis of what. And part of the reason why transformative experiences are interesting is because they, they stand in the way of uh, uh, choosing a particular path because you, there is a certain thing that you expect from taking that particular path. You just do not have any information about where the path is going to lead you. So I thought that, that, that this is how sort of this talk fits in this picture that we've been uh, looking at. So, so yes, I mean, in part the conclusion is a bit unnerving because it introduces more uncertainty <laughs> and more randomness in our goal-oriented behavior. On the other hand, it could be thought of as sobering because it could lead to the conclusion that we should, we should be more understanding of other people's core beliefs because uh, in virtue of having a better understanding of the processes that might lead to their acquisition and uh, how you know, hostage to the diaries of our lives these can be. There's also something exciting in this conclusion because it turns out that there are many chances of changing our minds. Um, 
and many more than we might normally normally think. Um, and now some open questions that also I think relate nicely to the themes of this, this conference is so I've shown that transformative experiences are the gateway to acquiring new <coughs> beliefs. But transformative experiences are not all of a kind. Actually, they can be extremely diverse. So one really interesting question here is what are the underlying mechanisms for different kinds of transformative experiences? What happens, what makes it the case that uh, actually this was one of the points of for Barry Robert to, to look at the, the Zoe's case, she said, well, it feels to Zoe as though there is a sudden change uh, in the way she feels about Brandon, but a more likely explanation is that there were unconscious emotions that built up over the course of time and at some point reached the conscious threshold. So I think that when, when we start thinking about transformative experiences, we're just scratching the surface of a really interesting and very uh, diverse phenomenon. It, it's really a label for something that might be very uh, um, varied in terms of its different instances and, and the mechanisms underlying it. So this, this is something that we'd like to think about more. Uh, and again, um, so I thought that this quote by Becca Wills related nicely to this idea. She says, she, in this paper, she talks about the hope of getting closer to a mixed uh, psychophysiological account, which would answer both the demands of scientific psychology um, to show how behavior can be rationally understood and provide a partial explanation of it in non-rational, not irrational, in non-rational terms. And this is how a better, this is what I would hope a better understanding of the mechanisms underlying transformative experiences might do. So show both how behavior can be rationally understood, but also understand it in, in non-rational terms and in terms of these underlying mechanisms that might not necessarily be um, in line with, with rationality. So, uh, and actually there's something more I'm going to talk about in a moment that also, um, uh, that is also in line with this book. Um, and so now I'm going to come back to this idea that I mentioned towards the beginning, which is that all beliefs in virtue of being beliefs that they identify with, uh, also behave in interesting ways in relation to evidence. So, um, I've, I've looked at the case of falling out of love, but falling in love could likewise be considered a transformative experience, leading to the formation of beliefs such as, in Zoe's case, Brandon is amazing, or Brandon is the love of my life. Assuming, as I think it makes sense to assume, that Zoe had the belief Brandon is amazing, this belief behaved in a very interesting way because it seemed to resist contrary evidence. So we saw this quote in which it would mention that there was you know, some distant treatment of her and, and, and other things. So it, it looks like, like Zoe had plenty of evidence against the idea that Brandon is this fantastic person, assuming that she had that belief and that that belief really matters to her. Right, so this was what, what the quote said. Um, so this belief, Assuming that she had one, because I think it makes sense to assume, really resisted contrary evidence. So why, why was it the case? Um, given that relevant evidence seemed to be available to Zoe for a long time, why did it take so long for Zoe to alter her view of Brandon? Um, and this relates nicely to a central question in philosophy psychology, which is do we update our beliefs in the light of contrary evidence or not? And, and the, the, the short answer is sometimes we do and sometimes we don't. Um, and here is an interesting case related to this. This is an actual experiment that has been made. Suppose that you had a specific religious belief and were presented with alleged evidence against that belief. And moreover, you believe that evidence. What do you think would happen? To your original religious belief. And I think that's sensible predictions to make in relation to the idea of common sense psychology and what it would be rational to do. I, I imagine that you would predict that you either give up that, that belief, that original belief, or at least hold it with lesser conviction. <clears throat> what has been shown is that people will actually hold the original belief with greater conviction. Uh, which is a phenomenon that's been labeled polarization by a belief disconfirmation. So this, this is actually a, 
um, experiment from, from a while back, but, but I think it's, it's really powerful in terms of what it shows. It, it's really counterintuitive in, in a way. So why does that? So this is an interesting case in which we do not update our beliefs in the light of contrary evidence. Uh, why is that? That's a really interesting question. And one possible explanation that I've recently started to explore is due by Eric Mandelbaum, who says we have reason to believe that there is a basic psychological immune system at work. We're back to the theme of the immune system, which is constantly adjusting belief to ward off serious threats to one's sense of self. So the more the person self-identifies with certain belief, and indeed we have good reasons for thinking that religious beliefs are like that. Very reasonable that they would be. That they are beliefs that people really identify with. But the more we identify with certain beliefs, a certain belief, the more likely the psychological immune system will be activated when that belief is under attack. And so it responds by strengthening that belief because of how much it matters for our self conception. So that's a kind of a really interesting kind of explanation. It's not mine, it's like Eric Mandelman, but I think it's a very promising avenue for explaining why some of our beliefs are so resistant to evidence and this might look like a digression but i'm actually going back to my topic which is that beliefs acquired through transformative experiences such as beliefs about loved one uh, might actually fit the pattern of being beliefs that we identify with and which therefore are very resistant to contrary evidence which is exactly what seems to have happened in the face of zodiac and generally, the beliefs acquired through transformative experiences are poor ones. So um, th this is why I'm insisting that I mean, I've realized that one reason why transformative experiences are so interesting is because they lead us to having these core beliefs that because of um, their being core, because of the extent to which we identify with them, also believe in these really interesting ways in relation to contrary evidence, maybe precisely because of the role that they have in relation to our uh, self conception. Um, so actually, I'm, I'm now uh, sort of uh, get them. So there is also an interesting connection here with also psychiatry, um, because in virtue of res being resistant to a certain kind of evidence, the the belief that we suppose Zoe might have that Brandon is amazing has also something in common with delusions, which are defined as fixed beliefs that are not amenable to change in the light of conflicting evidence. And this relates to a central question of philosophy psychiatry, which is, is there a boundary between pathological and non-pathological beliefs, or more generally mental states, even not beliefs, and how do we draw it? And uh, here I'm going back to something we were saying at the beginning, how uh, uh, Anita's work and example has inspired many people, because one of the references here is uh, Carolina Flores, who is another uh, former student of Anita's. So you can see that uh, uh, we're many and sort of gay. Um, so this is another reason why these, these sorts of beliefs acquired through transformative experiences are interesting. They also offer us an interesting case study for the philosophy of psychiatry because they're not typically held to be pathological. So Zoe's so belief that um, Brandon was amazing might have seemed a bit, I don't know, uh, not very well supported by evidence, but it, it wouldn't normally be considered pathological. But it has something in common with pathological beliefs, namely a certain kind of resistance to evidence. So it's also an interesting case study for that distinction. So um, to the extent that it's not evidence responsive, and yet not typically held to be pathological. So kind of straddles the boundary here. Right, so uh, what I've done today is I've told you about some of my current research about transformative experiences, um, both in the standard framework as challenges to the possibility of choosing rationally and the reason why I think they're interesting, which is as gateways to either acquiring or giving up core beliefs. And I have sketched like some directions of planned research about core beliefs and evidence resistance between so philosophy and psychology, the question of um, whether and why we give up beliefs in the face of contrary evidence, and the philosophy of psychiatry uh, when it comes to drawing a boundary between pathological and non-pathological uh, beliefs or more generally mental states. And uh, thanks for your attention.